forever lost. Amst and Rachel Tapig later admitted they were necking when their daughters Lily and Hilda wandered away from the picnic blanket they had spontaneously laid down near an old estate outside Hombad Mainburg, in the Tudoberg forest. Exactly how long it took the Tapigs to realize their girls were gone remains in dispute, but this much is certain, they were wearing white jumpers over black turtlenecks when they disappeared, they were virtually inseparable, and their bodies were never found despite extensive searches. Lily and Hilda's case briefly became news again in 1957, five years after they went missing, when this photo came to light. It was taken by a Belgian naturalist named Franz Orlin who claims he saw nothing moving through the forest that day. Urban legend thread post M if you got M. Pittsburgh has a few based purely on speculation but one tale is truly unique and fascinating this one is known as the Green Man. Born in 1918 a bright young boy barely eight years old accepted a dare that would alter his life forever. Raymond Robinson and his friends would frequent the Moreto Bridge to get to a popular swimming hole. Unbeknownst to them the bridge was incredibly dangerous as it had live cable wires that allowed trolleys cross at will. A child his same age had died a year earlier climbing the pole. Robinson's friends spied a bird's nest atop a tree close to one of these very poles. Not one to back down from a challenge Raymond climbed without hesitation. He touched the exposed wire nearly reaching the top and it sent 22,000 volts through his body. His right eye was severely burned and his eyes, nose, left ear, and most of his face was burned off. His friends called the police and he was rushed to a nearby hospital in Beaver Falls. He was not expected to live past a year but defied doctors' expectations. His facial features were all but gone and he lost his left arm was amputated. Regardless of the unfortunate event Raymond kept up high spirits hoping to return to his old life. Upon returning home he learned of the cruelty of his fellow peers. Because he was blinded could not comprehend the extent of his injuries. The children in his neighborhood were terrified of his appearance and he was shunned. He spent the next many years inside doing brain teasers and hiking in the woods in his backyard and making handmade wares to sell for his family's finances. Decades later he began taking long hikes on the highway that ran close to his home. With one foot on the pavement and a walking stick held in his one remaining arm he proceeded to go on long journeys up and down the freeway. It did not take long for rumors to spread of a faceless figure emerging from the darkness frightening passers-bys. As interest peaked many stopped to talk to him often taking sympathy to plight. He began to capitalize on the encounters asking for beer or cigarettes in exchange for a conversation or story which he told exceptionally well. Occasionally there would be thrill seekers and hecklers who would harass him and give him cigarettes laced with drugs. Despite this Raymond was never deterred and kept his walks up for many years to come. Eventually he allowed his picture to be taken for a price. He became known in the surrounding areas as the green man for undetermined reasons. Some say he often wore green shorts during the summer. Others say it was a jacket. Others argue it was his skin which had a green tint from the burns which did not completely heal properly. During the late 50s and early 60s his popularity was near legend in the area. As the years passed by the next generation became bolder and would sometimes take Raymond on excursions to nearby Pittsburgh to bars and to astonish friends. Other times young men would take their dates to see him in the hopes they would cling closer to them. It is not known what exactly transpired but in 1982 Raymond was placed in the care of a nursing home. On rumor states that he was driven to a tunnel at least 50 miles from his home and beaten severely by teenagers. After which he spent the remainder of his life in a nursing home. Legend holds that his ghost still haunts this tunnel waiting for bullies or hecklers to return to scare them off. It is said that if his ghost appears he will touch your car sending shock waves through. Cars often stall and explicably die in this tunnel as well. The tunnel was eventually filled with salt to deny people entrance and closed. When I was 19 I entered the army, Singapore, to serve a compulsory two years. Went through basic training, everything was fine. Found out I was selected to be a signaler after that. So I went to signal school for two months, which is in another army camp across the country. The building we trainees stayed in was a few decades old, but not too bad. It looked clean enough, there were all the bare facilities you'd expect dorms for sleeping in, toilets for showering and stuff, and a small corner on the ground floor for people to smoke. The first few weeks were uneventful. 
We slept in single beds, six in a row, facing each other. But from the third week on, things began to happen. Small things. But it was hard to ignore them. I slept in a bed which was in the middle of the bunk, and I faced the open windows. Our bunk was on the fourth floor, and there was a tree outside, so it never got too bright. So, for some nights, I would lie down go to sleep, but just before drifting to sleep, my bed would shudder. It was a jolt, just enough to wake me up, but there was nothing when I woke up fully. Or, there would be a random noise, a fractured sound to wake me up. Imagine someone saying something unintelligible to you out of the blue. I just brushed it off as, me being too tired, but as it continued to happen every other day it was hard to ignore. It also meant I slept poorly. I would later find out I wasn't the only one. But everyone had their own experiences, people just didn't want to share such things at first. I'll list some of the more major happenings in following posts. Letter limit is 2000, so I have to break this up into chunks. Pick is what an army bunk looks like. The layout is slightly different but you get the idea. Happening number 1. I woke up in the dark. I looked at my watch, it was 1 am. I was about to go back to sleep, but I heard two people talking. Thinking it were my fellow bunk mates, I sat up to have a better look. There was some faint moonlight coming in from outside, so I could make out shapes. The more I tried to make sense of it, the more I realized it wasn't natural. Everyone that I saw were clearly asleep in their beds. The muttering of two voices went on. The more I tried to listen to what they were saying, the more I could not understand them. They were not speaking in English or Chinese or any other language that I knew. It was a bunch of rapid gibbering noises. But there were clearly two voices. Terrified, I slipped back down into my bed. Happening number two. This was another night. I woke up again, but this time it was about 11.30 p.m. The room was quiet, everyone was sleeping. Suddenly I heard the sound of shuffling, the sound of flip-flops on bare concrete floor. It clearly originated in the room, but nobody was walking. The sound traveled from one end of the room, to the other. It was exactly as if someone was pacing the room, but I couldn't see him. When it reached the end of the room there would be a short pause. Then it'll start coming back again, in the other direction. Determined to know it wasn't just me, I rolled down to the side and reached across to tug my friend who was sleeping on his bed. He was annoyed and surprised to be woken up, naturally. But I whispered to him, do you hear that? He didn't understand what I was asking at first. But by the very faint light I saw his eyes widen in the dark. He could hear it too. Who is that? I don't know. There's nobody. After a while he shook his head and put his finger to his lips, beckoning me to be quiet. He turned around and wrapped his blanket over him. It was clear he didn't want to think too much about it. All this while, the bed shaking and other small miscellaneous. Occurrences continued every other day. The timing of them increased gradually over the weeks, slowly ratcheting up in intensity. One time there was a loud sound that took everyone by surprise, we were chatting and laughing normally and suddenly it came and shut everyone up. It was the sound of the metal window pane slamming shut. But nothing moved, the windows were fine. Another time the door to our dorm rattled loudly as though someone was trying to open it from the other side. Thinking it was our sergeants playing a prank on us, we opened the door. But looking down into the long corridor we were only greeted by a tunnel of inky darkness. Lights were off after 22.30, there would also be loud stomping sounds coming from above, even though the floor above us was uninhabited, locked off and empty at that time. There started to be gossip, of course. Bringing up the issue to our superiors were either met with denial or deflection, but it was clear from their eyes we weren't the first batch of trainees to experience this. And I wasn't the only one affected in my bunk, a few guys had it worse. People started moving out to sleep in spare beds in other rooms or even with other trainee batches, even though it wasn't allowed. I continued to stay, thinking I could just live with it, if only for a few weeks more until I graduate. Happening number 3, Major. I woke up again. I wanted to reach out to check the time, but I couldn't move. I was sleeping on my side, and there was a empty space on my bed. I realized I had sleep paralysis, 
So I didn't panic just yet. I couldn't move, but I could see the room just fine. I could see everyone sleeping, which windows were open. The leaves of the tree moving. I told myself I would just breathe normally and maybe I could wake up naturally. Then from the corner of my eyes, I saw something. Something that shouldn't be there. 5. Last. Something moved in the far corner. I tried squinting at it. Something tall, very skinny, and black. It looked exactly like a stick figure a kid would draw it would be almost comical if it weren't so terrifying. And if you don't believe me I would understand. It moved across the room, striding slowly in a broken and stiff way, like a bad animation that was missing some key frames. It walked slash limped across the room, as my terror built up and I tried to comprehend what exactly I was looking at. I wanted to say something, to do something, but I couldn't. Reaching my bed, it turned around to look at me. The face was round and featureless, save two dots for eyes and a long wide mouth that pulled up into a smile. It sat down on the empty space on my bed, and reached out with one of its arms. It had many fingers, I couldn't count them. Dried, wraithy fingers. It reached out and touched the solace of my bare feet. I could feel each finger, the dryness scraping against my solace, like worms digging for earth. With a massive effort I broke out and screamed. And screamed even more. People sat up and someone ran to turn on the lights. There was nothing there. I was sweating and swearing I saw shit. I could still feel the physical sensation of it, like an echo that contorts onto itself. I moved out to another bunk the next day. I've had enough, my mental health was suffering. Out of the 12 original occupants, I was the fifth guy to do so. There was only three weeks left in our training but I didn't want to sleep there anymore. This incident legit turned me from a half skeptic into, this shit is too much for me, man, I'm out of here. It can't be rationalized, I just don't want to be around anything like that ever again. It's very mentally taxing to have physical training in the day and can't even. Get a good night's rest later on, I started to doubt my judgment of reality, it's totally not fun at all when you really encounter such things IRL. Have a story of something that happened to me a few years ago, in my culture witchcraft and the supernatural in general are just a part of life, I was born and raised in the states mostly but I spent a lot of time in Mexico and my roots there run deep. My family especially is supposedly blessed with sensitivity and magic as we have multiple curanderas, healers, and some brujas, witches. My mother especially has been able to sense ghosts and otherworldly beings since she was a kid and I have personally witnessed some pretty fucking strange things growing up thanks to her. My dad was raised atheist and would make fun of my mom when they first met, but suffice it to say ever since I've known him he's been a full-blown believer. Anyway, this story happened right out of high school over the course of a few weeks and is relatively tame compared to some of the crazier shit I've seen but it's the weirdest. 15 years ago. Just graduated high school and decided to take a year off and figure out what to do next. Parents have property in Mexico City. Four houses spread out across about five dozen acres. Lakes, creeks, thick vegetation, and forests and cave systems litter the territory. The surrounding land is all thick forest with scattered homestead here and there. Used to be a farm but now it's used mostly for hunting trips into the bush. Decide I'll look after the place for the next year and just relax. Caretaker warns me not to go into the northern expanse at night. Tells me not to spend the night in the northernmost property. Why is that? Coyotes. Boars. No Mijo, they've been finding dead animals all over the northern territory for the last few years. Puma. Don't know but they've been taking the hearts, eyes, and tongues, probably a bruja. Scoff at him and assure him I'll be careful. Say farewell and head toward the westernmost territory. Four hours later arrive at a modest mini Victorian era house. Get settled and start cleaning. Caretaker lives in the southernmost house on the property. Nearest neighbor is 20 miles away nearest town is 30. After a few days of exploration I spot a herd of boars heading north. Jet home to grab my rifle and start tracking. After three hours I run out of water so I backtrack to a small creek to grab some more. 
when I survey the area to make sure there are no coyotes or pumas drinking. Spot something moving about 200 meters due north. Zero in with my scope and it's a dead coyote. Decide to investigate. When I get there I literally gasp and get lightheaded. About 15 dead coyotes, from pup to adult still warm spread around. From the looks of it they'd been dead for about one or two hours, shoddy but similar cuts from sternum to groin, no liver, heart, tongues cut out. Hear someone taking a breath so I drop my knife and raise my rifle in the general direction about 20 feet to my left. Remember what the caretaker said about the northern expanse. I sense someone is there but can't be sure as the forest is too thick. EY Quian Anda. A few minutes of nothing but my own breathing I slowly kneel down to pick up my knife and start backing up. After crossing the stream I lower my rifle and keep my back to the sun as I turn and book it. As I'm leaving I hear a grunting almost cooing sound like yuhin yuhin. Put my hand on my knife and look at my watch. 5.41 PM. Think fuck me as the sun sets in about an hour and I'm at least three hours from home. Decide to crash in the northernmost house as it's only 30 minutes away. When I arrive the house is decent condition. Grab some cacti as it repels a bruja from entering a room. Bless some of my water in some old cups and place them at the entrances of the house. Spread some salt in the room I'm staying in and draw a moon on it. As the sun sets I gaze out the window watching for movement. Fall asleep after a few hours. Wake up to the sound of the same grunting but this time I hear dragging sounds. Rocks being thrown at the house. Yell out I didn't come to disturb you, I don't care what you're doing out here. Hear laughing and maybe dancing. After a while the laughing fades off into the distance and it gets quiet again. When morning breaks I start making my way off to the southernmost house to talk to the caretaker. Confirm there's a witch taking animal parts probably a young one just judging from her laugh and the amateurish cuts on the animals. Tell him to avoid the northern forests and territory and she'll move on eventually. Decide to move lock up the northern and western houses and move into the easternmost house as it's closer to the caretaker and farther away from the northern forest. Everything is all good for the next couple of weeks got some hunting in explored some really cool caves and clearings. When I was visiting some family in town they were talking about the northern forest and the witch. Tell them I had a run in with it. They tell me there's been an increase in witches for some reason as the surrounding towns have all been having their issue. Auntie says they leave the people alone but they've been feeding on fear. Cousin says he saw one driving down the highway the other day. Grandma gives me a rosary and some other supplies to bless my house. Head back home in the evening. As I'm pulling up to the house I sense something again. Put my hand on knife and stare at the general direction of the feeling. With my other hand I mutter a few prayers. After a while the feeling fades so I turn and head inside. For the next few days I find little gifts scattered around the house. Rat tongues, idols covered in blood and carvings of what I can only assume would be me. So I respond by placing salt on the entrances, carving little moons on pieces of wood and scattering them around the property and planting some aloe vera sprouts around the house. After a while I assumed she got bored or annoyed so it left the head of a boar on top of my jeeps who had stopped coming. A couple of weeks later I closed up the eastern house and checked the rest of the properties before spending my final night at the caretaker's house. I was in bed sleeping when I woke up paralyzed. I felt someone crawl into bed with me I looked to my left and it was a girl. Not pretty nor ugly just extremely plain. Except her eyes they were a bright hazel almost golden amazingly beautiful. She snuggled up to me and played with my hair before she closed my eyes with her fingers. An overwhelming urge to sleep hit me and I was out. Woke up to my pants unbuttoned and scratches all over me no blood but they hurt like hell. Shit.jpg As I was packing up and leaving the caretaker said he was planning to ask his brother to move onto the property too told him I'll let my parents know and they'll talk next weekend. Swing by my granny's place to say my goodbyes. Before I get out of my car my aunts and grandma rush out and ask me what's wrong. 
Say I'm fine but they open my shirt and freak out cause of the scratches. She wants him for herself. Tell me I better get cleansed or my soul will be corrupted. Reaffirm and say I'm totally fine I'll have my mom take care of it when I get back. They're adamant they do it because by then the damage would be too severe. Humor them just to ease their worry. Sit in chair as my aunties and grandma cleanse the hex. Rub an egg all over me as they pray. Rub aloe vera on my scratches then sprinkle salt. Give me an amulet of a moon. Takes about two hours but I honestly felt better which is weird because I felt fine before. I say my goodbyes and start heading out of town. It's around 7ish pm when I hit the other side of the northern forest. As I look into the forest I spot a white owl just staring at my as I drive by. I swear I heard the same laughing as it faded in my rear view. I got a quick one. Here goes. Be me and Cub Scouts. Around third grade or so. Live in the low country of South Carolina. One day our scout leader, I forgot the proper terminology, literally been out of scouts since elementary school, decides to have a large camp out on his property. Scouts and parents were invited as well. Day comes, everyone arrives. Place is basically several acres of cornfields slash wheat slash tall grass shit, with the dude's house on one end, and the campsite on the other. The perimeter of the land is a forest, with the campsite being a half circle of cleared forest. This whole area is about 5 miles away from civilization. About 10 to 15 kids with their parents show up for the night. I'm gonna skip the events we did in the day because they don't matter slash I don't remember. Anyways. Night sets in. One of the chaperone slash scout leaders asked me and two other kids to pick up firewood from his truck. We grab our flashlights and head out, probably a third of a mile walk to the truck. We take a path through the corn stalks. Path is mowed down, maybe three yards wide. Then I see something. I just want to mention that I remember this moment clear as day. This shit happened when I was a kid, and I'm 21 now. I lift up my flashlight to see what it is. All I saw was a tail sticking out of the corn stalks about 15 feet in front of me. It basically looked like a rat's tail, color was whitish pinkish, but the base of the tail looked like it was at least 3 feet off the ground. Whatever that thing was just kept moving into the corn stalks, dragging its tail behind. The other two kids and I confirmed that we all saw it. I was too scared to look into the corn stalks. We finished the errand and came back with firewood. Nothing strange happened the remainder of the trip. I never got to see the body of the thing, but I could not think of an animal where I live that has a tail like that and is that tall. 2006. Baby brother and I go camping in the Rockies each year. This year we decide to do something a little different and switch up camping spots. Scout the area, end up choosing a very secluded place out near a small river. We're about 50 miles from the nearest town and we haven't seen another car in hours, it's off season. We end up getting baked and have a good time running around like assholes breaking branches and throwing stuff in the river. Water is way too cold to swim in and we have no fishing gear so we mostly ignore it aside from throwing stuff. Later, it's getting dark and we've got our fire going. I'm making dinner and brother is out getting some more firewood. He comes back just in time, it's basically full dark. Toss some wood on the fire, start eating dinner. We start hearing snapping coming from somewhere to our south. We have our rifles and I have a small knife. We call out to see if it's another person. No answer. The snapping continues until it's only about 10 yards from us. Stops. Brother and I are more curious than afraid at this point. I call out again. Someone comes out of the tree lean and into the clearing where we've set up. Young dude in a hoodie. He asks us if he can have something to eat. He doesn't look dirty or hurt, but he seems really off. I'm reluctant but my brother tells him sure. Guy sits down and starts eating. I ask him if he's lost. He doesn't answer, just keeps eating slowly brother asks if he needs help or something. I don't remember exactly what he said, but this is the nearest I can remember. It's the gist of it, anyway. 
Guy starts telling us a story in this really low, monotone voice. I'm from city name, state, I can't remember those. I didn't get along with my mother. We had a fight and she told me to leave. I've been walking the state since then. I don't know where I am. I think I must have taken a wrong turn. Probably just a wrong turn. I'm more confused than anything but my brother looks more and more concerned the longer the guy talks. I start getting into what he's saying. I was supposed to meet up with the interstate. I think I must have just taken a wrong turn is all. My things are somewhere around here. I left home. I've been walking the state since. My mother and I had a fight. I think I just must have taken a wrong turn. I'm so weirded out that I don't notice my brother has picked up his rifle. Hear the click of the safety and see he's got it resting in his lap. He's staring at the guy. The guy is starting back with a kind of vacant surprised expression. You've had your food. I think it's best you move on now. My brother says. He moves his finger closer to the trigger. The guy doesn't seem shocked or even angry. He and my brother have a staring match for a solid 10 seconds of silence. Don't know what the fuck is going on but I trust my brother so I don't say anything. Guy gets up and walks slowly back into the trees, glancing back every few steps. Notice his face starts to sag a little, like the strings have gone out of it. Eventually he disappears back into the trees. After a good long silence I finally ask my brother what the fuck just happened. He's clearly shook up. You didn't notice? The whole time he was talking to us, dude never breathed. Not once. He just paused to make it seem like he did. Of course I shit myself and we decide, dark or not, we're getting the fuck out. Get loaded up and drive the fuck out of there. As we're leaving, we see a few flashes of what might be a person through the trees. We floor it and don't slow down until we hit the next town. Decide to stay in motels for the rest of the trip. During a period from 1946 to 1952, in a small town in western Germany, the residents heard what resembled a six-gun salute on every 15th of March. Some residents made frequent trips into the surrounding hills in hopes of finding the source of the noise, but to no avail. The townsfolk eventually coined the area as, Gunpowder Hill. The children of the town even created a legend about it, stating that soldiers, who in that time were missing but presumed dead, had been killed in an execution-style massacre, and were buried somewhere in the hill. The purpose of the six-gun salute was to guide people to the location of the men. On every 15th of March, the children of the town would gather outside to the edge of town, eagerly awaiting the six-gun shots to be heard. In late 1951, the hills on the outskirts of the small German town were surveyed for the future construction of a NATO military site. The military base was to consist of a series of deep underground bunkers and weapons supplies in the event of a Soviet invasion. In February of 1952, construction began. Just four weeks into construction, the crew began digging a massive 200 deep foot hole for the future underground storage bunkers. It was during this time that the crew made a morbid discovery. As they neared the end of the digging operation, a human hand was seen sticking out of the bottom of the hole. Upon future examination, 27 bodies were discovered at the bottom of the 200 foot deep hole dressed in prisoner of war uniforms worn by the Allies in Nazi war camps. A NATO officer ordered for the bodies to be exhumed immediately. As the medical team slowly carried out the bodies, they looked on in puzzlement. The bodies were remarkably well preserved. Furthermore, the POW uniforms bore a strange insignia not one of the men had seen before, an orange circle with a single black dash in the middle. However, the most unsettling characteristic were the faces of the men who were exhumed. Their eyes were wide open, and their mouths were sealed shut with an unknown adhesive. The bodies were then dispatched to the local morgue for immediate identification and autopsies. That night, the local mortician began his work. However, he found it difficult to concentrate on his task. The eyes of the first man he was to begin work on seemed to be staring back at the mortician from the autopsy table. He shook his head and just rationalized the sight as the imagining of his overactive mind. The mortician took his scalpel and began his first cut into the body's chest. 
Blood poured out of the incision with staggering force. The mortician backed away from the table in shock. The red liquid began running down the table, pooling on the floor below. The eyes of the body began watering, and streaks of tears ran down its face. Soon, the eyes rolled back into the body's head, and the bleeding ceased. In horror, the mortician began to make his way to the door on the verge of nausea, but not before catching a glance at the 26 other bodies lying out on separate tables. Their eyes looked back at the doctors with tangible fear. The men were still alive. Be dude weed lmao type of teenager. Basically fed up and want to do something different during my high school holidays. I was 15 at the time, this was back in 2004. Friend of mine invites me to go camping with him in this place called Ilha du Mel, literally translated to Honey Island. During high season it's full of normies and families but off season it's just natives and people who want to get high and abuse drugs. We obviously decide to go in the off season. Buy tickets, borrow tents, pick some weed for our stay. Had been there with family as a kid but never as a grown up. Always stayed at the island's main hotel when I went there. It was my first time camping so I was very excited. After a long day of bus plus ferry, finally reach the destination. Sort of worn out. Have a beer and a burger at the island's only open diner at this time of the year. While there, overhear a girl speaking English. Look in her direction. It was a group of three girls actually, seemed like they were also there for dude weed lol. They were talking to this rough, native looking guy. Didn't look like they knew the local language, Portuguese, they seemed to be getting by by speaking broken Spanish and trying some easy English words here and there. Seemed like they were trying to buy something or he was offering them something, drugs, likely. Too tired to try and strike up conversation with them, fuck it. Just munch my burger and light up a ciggy after I'm done. While friend and I are smoking, a boorish geezer approaches us. Literally, pissed hey kid at us, not even joking. Yeah what up my dude? You guys camping? Cuz I know a nice, cheap place. We look at each other and basically think yeah na. Then he says. It's 5 bucks a night, open space only about 50 meters from the sea, has an outhouse and you can smoke as much as you want and if you need it we can arrange it for yeah. Fuck actually a much better deal than everything we had seen so far. Of course it looks like the fucker is going to rob us the first chance he gets but then again this is how everyone looks in the place so and we were 15 and stupid we accept his offer and go with him to the place. Turns out he wasn't lying. Quite an alright place, he has a small house at the place, wherein he lives with his wife. There's also a shed and the aforementioned outhouse. As we arrive, his wife greets us and literally offers us and lizard soup and lizard soup, it stinks but tastes good, or so she says. Nah we're good, just want to set up our tent and sleep through the night. Okie dokie, we pay for the night and for the next 4 days. Smoke a joint and go to sleep. Wake up next day feeling refreshed. Smoke a blunt, light up a cig. Let's explore. Ah yes. Explore the island we do. Basically be out the entire day. Come back at night, quite tired. Rolling another joint when notice strange man walking into camp. Passes us by, doesn't say a word, goes straight to camp owner's house. Hear some laughter. Figure their friends, whatever. Guy comes out after some time, comes up to me. You got a sig kid? Sure. Here you go Brett. Lights up the sig. It's a nice night eh? He says. Eh. This guy is odd. He looks like someone I know, it really feels like I know him but I can't quite put my finger on where I have seen him before. He says something under his breath and then pulls out a fucking hunting knife out of his jean shorts. You guys ever open up a lizard? Or a pig? No gotta learn how to do it if you live here, not much to eat, especially if you don't make load of money. 
asks us if we want to catch some lizards with him in the deep of the island. Not sure what to say, don't want to upset the guy, he looks unstable. Then he starts laughing. Just messing with ya kid, hey, gotta another one of those cigs so I can smoke one later in the night. Sure man, here you go h ha ha. He leaves. Felt spooked but the owner of the camp assured me that's just how the guy was, he said the guy was married but lost his wife in some sort of accident. Living in an island by yourself does things to you I imagine, so we didn't really question much and just continued to smoke like a bunch of retards. On the third day, it sort of hits me who the guy was that asked for a sig. He was the same guy who was talking to the foreign girls I saw on the first day at the island, I recognized him because of a cap he was using of the biggest football team in our state. Third day coming to an end. Really, really tired. We walked and explored slash covered a sizable part of the island. It was sort of raining lightly. Friend had already gone to sleep. About midnight. I want to smoke another before I get some shut eye. Rolling ma joint. Smoke it. Pretty stoned. Go to tent. Sleep. Thud. Thud thud asterisk. Thud thud thud. Asterisk muffled noise in the distance. Groggy as fuck. The fuck man. Rummaging for my phone. Check time. 3 something am. It's still raining, stronger now though. Hear sound of a door opening. Hear dragging sound. SHSH. Yup, sounds like plastic being dragged on the ground. Hear sound of door again. Gotta piss. Right as I'm about to unzip my tent hear dragging and muffled noise again. Hear door closing. Quietly unzip tent, go out to outhouse to take a piss. While pissing stare at the wall, the outhouse is made of wood and has somewhat large cracks through which you can see. Hear door opening. See same odd hunting knife guy coming out of shed, goes into the deep wood slash dark. Sort of freeze for some reason. Remain there for what is 5 or 6 minutes. See him coming back up. Carrying a large bag, I swear I hear some form of crying from it. Can fucking see there's something moving inside the bag. Drags it to the shed, close door. Wait a bit. Wait a bit more. He doesn't come out. Sprint to my friend's tent, quietly tap on the outside. He opens up his tent. Go inside. Tell him what I saw, he thinks I'm fucking with him. We wait silently inside the tent. After a while, hear noise. Loud banging noises. More muffled noises. More banging noises. Hear guy cursing out loud. Door slammed. Sounds of someone pacing around in a hurried manner. Bangs the camp owner's door, sounds like it. Hear conversation. More dragging sounds and doors opening slash closing. This keeps going on for a good 30 minutes or so. Friend has been shitting self for the past minutes. I'm just speechless. We're just looking at each other not knowing what to do. After a while noises seem to stop. Rain increases. It's ridiculously strong at this point. Just sit inside the tent without uttering a word. Time passes by. Rain begins to die down. Look at cell phone. Around 5 am. Friend asks me what we should do. Tell him we should just stay awake. Stay awake till 8 am literally doing fuck all inside tent. Once rain stops, go out. Seems like no one but us is at the camp. Start packing our things up. No shits given, just pack everything as fast as we can. Leave before anyone comes back. Go and take the first ferry in the morning back to closest town. Thank God it was our last day there. We even left some money as a tip to the camp owner. Never bothered looking inside the shed to see if there was anything weird, never bothered waiting, never bothered doing fuck all about it. Just called it quits right there and then and got the fuck out of the place as soon as we could. At first I thought my co-worker at Exide, 
definitely not the Office of Secret Intelligence, Sandy S. B. Bushy got that fake name because her job was to make the data set in the data warehouse non-relational with Sand as it were. Since that time I have come to suspect that Sandy Bushy is actually pick related, the toy box killer as a tranny, also like pick related. In that case, when the toy box killer was using gynecological instruments to stretch out women's vaginas in his dungeon, was he filling their vaginas up with sand? Is that he was used to do before he became my co-worker? I remember one time around 2001 tower day my dad recounting some instance to me. He said someone got there, pussy filled up with sand, and he certainly cast in a bad light, like it was terrible and he didn't like it, and he was almost aghast in the recounting, and I am no suggesting he is into that sort of thing, only that it came up once. Is that what they used to have Sandy S.B. Bushy doing before she became my boss at Exide? The toy box killer's meme was making slaves and I think when Exide sells those slaves they call them batteries. Totally unrelated, it says the head of OSI is General Timothy Trister and the third person doing the ETL besides Sandy and I was Tim. I was wondering if they faked his death and turned him into a tranny to be my co-worker at OSI. I mean a major sports related business. That mugshot of David Parker Ray is the absolute spitting image of my co-worker Sandy. The face meme is the same to the 10 millionth degree. When I was working on two reports as by developer there, one was TNA, tits and ass, and the other was Ina which was, industrial something something. Even before I had ever seen this photo of the killer, I had come to suspect that this was the report for the human trafficking and snuff activities. At Exide, they sell batteries and I wonder if they are selling children to be drained of blood like the blood bags in the recent Mad Max movies and then calling the children batteries. At Exide, I came across some very unusual project docs. It was an Excel file but it was so stupidly formatted so that there was no way you could reasonably look at it on single computer screen, you would need like a whole movie theater to view this Excel file. It had rows in it like, customer abuse, and, not analyzed. I had seen another project doc like that at my previous place of employment where the whole data system was normal except for this one weird table DBO. Psych to fill which was the sick D file table. Although Sandy was a nasty scrawny bitch, sometimes I would see her walk by and her hips would be like twice as wide as they normally looked. This made me think different people were wearing the Sandy mask to sit at Sandy's desk where lies the computer which makes the data non-relational and uses a two column key DRRT and DRSY, dirt and dirt. Scientology. To hide certain data in a non-standard place where no one using the data warehouse could ever see it. I had seen some transcript or something in which the toy box killer went into some detail about how he hunted for his slaves out in town and then gathered them into his dungeon, and on the show, this tranny is named, Hunter Gathers. The time it finally clicked for me that Sandy's whole job was job to always lie about everything was when I was developing a certain sequel report. The customer was wanting the columns, facility type, and, facility classification, to appear in the report but those columns were getting loaded with the wrong thing. Sandy kept telling me the wrong thing, and then when I started putting her on the spot about why she was always having me redo the report with new but still wrong columns, she pretty much started acting like she couldn't understand English. I did it in front of the manager Rod Williams, one day, and she was just completely acting like a crazy person, ignoring the same question when I posed it to her, him, a dozen times in a row. Rod saw her doing that and thought it was fine, and the topic of weekly meeting every week was why Sandy told us the wrong thing in the previous week's meeting. Rod's job is to facilitate her lies. Don't get Rodney Williams mixed up with Rodlene Williams. Rod Williams looks just like the Atlanta child murderer Steve Collins who is the father of recently notorious gangster El Menko and Rodlene is a false identity used by my mother, sister, Helene. I documented all of Sandy's bullshit in the audit tracker at Exide. Her gimmick is to always combine existing issues with new issues without fixing them. Every time she says, let's not do issue number 10 and just combine it with issue number 15, then Rod says, okay. Then she closes issue 10 as completed, says. Let's combine this thing from issue 15 with issue 21, and then Rod says, okay and then they close issue 15 as completed. It is a simple gimmick they have going on up there. They get away with it because they are all in on it together. One of the toy box killer's torment was to use electricity both as a punishment and also use random electric shocks as a fuck you to his victims.
I have implants in my foot and anus that deliver electric shocks to me during IRL gang stalking incidents and also seemingly at random. I have noticed the one in my anus zap me several times right when push enter on making an anti-Trump post. I think Trump, Putin, and I were all in a meeting together at Exide in December 2016. Putin disguised as Rod, Helene slash K slash Erod Lean is the notorious Putin's niece, and Trump disguised as my co-worker Dave. Over the summer I was no homeless for a few months. Every time my roommate would come home and start making noise in he kitchen, I would also get electric shocks in my anus. Pick related, you can kind of see the resemblance between Helene's father and Putin in this picture. Obviously Putin is a lot more fair. Child is me. To start I apologize in advance for the length of this story and want to firmly make sure that I do not care if it is believed or not. If you cannot believe it I can only say I understand and wouldn't myself if I hadn't experienced it. This was three years ago. I was doing postgraduate study which concerned aboriginal communities. I was allowed a placement in the Yaengu town of Ramininning in Amhem land, which is a tiny strip of halfway urbanized land that borders the huge fuck off bug which is rather kindly called Errorfura Swamp. The swamp is probably one of the most wild places in Australia. Imagine a country-sized swathe of perpetually decaying forest flooded in a stagnant foul-smelling water plain. And with crocs a real danger. My place was basically a shack and it was right at the edge of the swamp. It was technically not within the town limits and actually sat a good couple of miles away along a dirt road. It was an abandoned country house and I had it all to myself. The back had a veranda that looked out over the great black swamp, some very impressive views come dusk and on either side it was enclosed in a dusty circle of eucalyptus. I knew literally no one out there and won't lie when I say it was pretty creepy those first weeks trying to acclimate to being more truly alone than I had ever been before, in this old rusty tin shed of a house halfway out of town in a clearing at the edge of the swamp. But adaptiveness is a virtue and I soon found myself spending my spare time fixing up the place and even sowing seed out the front and chopping some littler trees down. I remember my pride as I felled a small tree for the first time, after hours of panting. When I went into town and sold off the wood I told the folk there it had taken a lot less time than it really did. They were all well accustomed to hard labor and it was quite a culture shock when I took dinner at homes that didn't have a television, let alone a computer. The people did not all live in exactly what would be termed poverty as some places were wealthier than others in the typical sense and there was a real effort at maintaining a distance from some norms of outer society anyway. For example there was, and remains, a ban on booze that was taken fairly seriously while I was there. So I was sober for a full year, although many hearing the story have suggested I was drunk or high. The first month or so was rocky but invigorating and really kept me going. As I've said I struggled a bit with the isolation and having to spend my time doing things I never would usually like tilling the soil and chopping timber wood but it was good detox and after a while the smell of the swamp got less shit. At first the sounds of the different birds and nightlife damn near kept me up at night but in time I learned to distinguish the birds and reptile noises and found comfort in them. On two occasions I was lucky enough to hear the booming voice of a croc near the house. It was real back to nature shit and by the second month I really got into the swing of it, and had adapted fully to having long periods of time alone with myself in the bush. It was sometime this second month that it first happened, though at the time I thought nothing of it. I was sitting on the back veranda on a very warm, crisp afternoon. I was reading, I think, when after some time I became aware of a strange silence. I had to strain my ears for a while but soon I could confirm that there was only the sounds of a slight breeze, the soft movement of water and the creak of my rocking chair. The usually all-enveloping choir of birds bugs and frogs had at some point subsided. As I registered this sudden silence a feeling like no other crawled down me and I actually physically shuddered. It was like my bones were briefly frosted and I was washed over with an internal coldness and a tingle throughout my skin. I became very dizzy and thought I might vomit so. So I stood up and in the second that I put my head it happened and was over before I could register what I had seen. It's impossible t described how I must be perceived at the time all I can say is that I saw a nearby tree, a long thin white spear that stood some distance back from and beneath a couple bigger ones. This tree was like many others, it had shed its branches, leaving just the thing trunk standing upright. What I saw was this tree twitching rapidly, like it was having a fucking seizure, before wriggling into place and going still again. 
No other tree nearby did the same. I doubted my own eyes. Dizziness forgotten I stared at it for a long time, not terribly scared but not particularly comfortable either. I could not tell what I had seen and whether or not it was a side effect of head rush or not. The tree just stood there, still as ever and I noticed the bird song had come back and warmth returned to my body and I forgot about it for a long time. I had gotten in with a school teacher in the area and now spent three weekdays getting to talk to kids at the education center, so I was spending less daylight hours at the house. On those swamplit dusks I would tend to sit on the veranda and have a quiet smoke, maybe read until night came. As summer was turning into whatever season came next, the cycle was not very pronounced in that region, which remains very humid most of the year, I noticed an increase in insects. I don't mind bugs but I think everything is slightly creeped out by those long-legged flying crane flies, but which in that area were called daddy long legs. I remember sitting at the veranda and seeing for the first time a great swarm of the things, maybe just hatched, forming great clouds against the orangey light of the sky. The crane flies in that swamp got so fucking big you could hear them rustling against each other and that is no exaggeration. These things could be meters away and you would hear the vibration sound of their wings. As I say I'm not too afraid of bugs but when I went to take a piss in the middle of the night, the toilet was bit of an outhouse, and find myself in a cramped space with a gull-sized cran effly buzzing around the light. Occasionally bumping into me and feeling my body with its long horrible legs I was a tad on edge. The other bug which began to cause me some anxiety was a kind of mollusk like a barnacle which would appear in clumps on the water edge after it had been raining. These things weren't particularly creepy, but they worried me because they grow rapidly and would often spread to the steps on the veranda. I asked a local fisherman how to remove them and he went into his truck and returned with a metal paint scraper. So I added the job of scraping these little barnacle things off the old wooden steps. It was not fun experiencing their reddish interior bodies, the way they peeled off like a hard-shelled scab and the truly noxious smell. Aside from the growing presence of the insects inside and around the house I was keeping well. I kept clearing the area of weed plants and chopping down little trees to sell in the town. As well as insects the seasonal change had brought a tide of litter in the water, which I was told happened every year. More and more clumps of old plastics and bottles and shit was accumulating in a line of detritus outside the house. I started picking it up in the mornings, keeping the water clean a while I was there. It was as I did this one morn that for whatever reason I chose to look directly up at that old white tree I'd briefly freaked out over and saw it was not there. At first more confused than frightened I paced the water line, convinced I had mistaken where it was placed. But no, there was no mistake. Everything about the area looked as it always had, clear in my mind from many evenings study. All but that little tree, where now there was just a bare spot of land. I had no time to think of it but as I spent the day teaching I more and more dreaded the return home. I even tried to arrange for a couple of friends I'd made to come over that night but they insisted on postponing till the weekend. So I drove home alone that night and when I got back it was full dark. The evening calls of the owls and swamp birds gave me little comfort. I couldn't shake the image of that shivering tree. I had no reason to think anything of it, nor what it might mean but the image, like a horrible glitch in reality pestered me no matter how much I tried to distract myself. I'll never forget that night as I lay wide awake in the dark hearing outside my window this sound, this slow drawn out creak and cracking noise. I'd heard it before, one sound of the forest out of many, but on this night it pierced my frayed nerves. I lay there a long time listening to it. It sounded like some kind of rickety pole were swaying barely inches from my window. I was too shit scared cowardly to look out the window so I examined the patch of moonlight it cast on the floor. I could see so many moving things, the limbs of the trees in the wind, that it was impossible to make out anything. Then, with total clarity I heard this dreadful noise. Tap. 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 Against the glass. There was no mishearing it, no denying it. As plain as day, there was something tapping the glass just above my head. There was no tree growing near the window, nor even a bush or anything else for that matter. I frantically tried to think up contrived reasons, maybe the guttering had fallen loose and was tapping the glass in the wind, or it was one of those crane flies hitting the glass, but I couldn't bring myself to look and lay there, rigid, pretending to be asleep. I waited like this for about 20 minutes before the noise faded. 
It took me a while to work up the nerve to look out but of course when I did there was nothing there. After a while it was easier to convince myself that it actually had been something normal, that it was just a minor thing and got to sleep. The next day was particularly bright. It was that kind of heat which is thick and palpable in the air which is saying something given the usual weather. In a way my memory of the day, revisited so many times is saturated in heat, like a photo gets dimmed over time left in the light. When first I got up it was just another day. The events of the previous night and the odd tree were forgotten as I went through the automatic morning rituals. It hadn't got really hot yet and everything was nicely lit. The view of the swamp was gorgeous, the sun behind the canopy seemed to frost every leaf with gold. There was an upswell of bird noise and I saw a couple of waiting birds out for frogs or lizards, anticipating the heat of the day. I worked a lot on my study in the morning. After a few too many coffees I came down with that overstimulated restlessness and couldn't focus on work anymore, continuously looking out the window and finding chores to do. The view out the window was especially appealing. The caffeine and the brightness projected everything in rich detail. Seeing some rubbish on the shoreline I convinced myself to dredge it out. So, happily I went down to the water and mucked about the little islands and rivulets picking up the junk that had floated in overnight or maybe some had just been bobbing there a long time before I came, it was hard to tell, stacking it up into a little pile of gunk. This is when some strange things happened, in one moment. I noticed a bound book, half buried at a detritus bank around the shoreline. Consciously I picked it out of the rest, having a feeling about it. So I crack it open, it's a bit encased in mud, and opened up a couple of pages. It was the annual collected issues of a business journal. There were lots of different issues with covers and stuff. It seemed business oriented. At the back, however, was a list of the year's grants. That included scholarships for university work. Scrolling the list of scholarship grants, I saw my, in plain delight, my name. I haven't told this story to many people but whenever I do they seemed unimpressed by this fact. Of course it was there. I did have a scholarship and it was a business journal with a list of scholarship grants. I know and I'm not saying it was paranormal necessarily. But understand how weird it felt to be the furthest you've ever been from home, pick a random book out of the water and see your own name in it. Regardless of how stupid it was I fucking shivered. I closed the book and put it in the junk pile. Then I stood to get up and saw a man standing on the other side of the stream watching me. Already a little unsettled I nearly fucking shat myself when I saw him. It wasn't just that I hadn't seen a single other person on the property since I'd been there, it wasn't just that he was standing there, silently, look at me, he was also standing half behind the trunk of a tree, so I could only see one arm and a leg and one half of his face. But he wasn't hidden at all and couldn't have been trying to be. He was just standing halfway behind a tree. His shirt and pants were a brownie grey and pretty faded into the background, but his face and limbs were white and stood out in contrast. Before I have time to collect myself I see his one arm waving at me, in a friendly gesture not in a threatening way at all. I wave back and then stand there not knowing what to do because he doesn't fucking make a movement he just stays exactly where he is, looking at me. There's no way I'm approaching this guy so I just wave again, kind of vaguely pointing towards my house to indicate I'm going inside or something. He waves back but still doesn't move. So I head back to the house, trying to carefully to maintain a steady pace, for some reason not wanting to walk too fast to give away how rattled I was. Once I dared to look over my shoulder, and caught sight of his leg, turned back and going into the forest. Slightly relieved I went back home and locked the doors. I wanted to latch the windows even but the heat contained in the house was already great enough with them open. The wallpaper glue was visible on the walls like sweat. The isolated events now weighed on me heavily. While previously none of these weird incidents had overwhelmed my experience I was now unable to stop my heart racing, stop scaring myself with thoughts of that fucking man standing behind that fucking tree. With great difficulty I calmed myself enough to decide that heading into town was the best option. Not trusting the security of the place I decided I would bring my laptop and shit. So I'm sitting at the table brooding over my breakfast bowl and I become aware of a disturbance of light on my right hand side. I tum and holy fuck there is face right there. I swore aloud and stood up, nerves on the edge of actually fucking splitting. The face leans back and I see two arms raise. 
It's a man, his shirt, and whiteness making me instantly aware it's the creep from the swamp. I hear him say, sorry didn't mean to scare yet, or something like that and say he didn't know the place was occupied, that he saw me down on the swamp and was intrigued by a stranger to the place. He asked to come in. I said yes, what else could I do? And went to open the front door for him. For a moment he stood on the doorstep, then smiled and gave me his hand to shake and said thanks and nice to meet you and such, then he came in. Up close the guy looked pretty old. He was encrusted in a tan but clearly white and his skin looked pretty cracked up and wrinkled in places. His face had a spooky quality even though it wasn't particularly fucked up it's hard to explain. It wasn't a major difference or anything but his face and especially his expression just seemed a bit younger somehow than the rest of him. I was probably just dazed off the heat and the day's events but this has always stayed in my memory, how his face was just a little off. It was sort of awkward, me walking pointlessly into the kitchen and him standing in the doorway between it and the hall, smiling but not talking. I asked if he wanted coffee and he said sure and sat down, then asked about me and what a whitey was doing out in the swamps. I told him about my studies and such sort of vaguely, tentative to say too much to this weird smiling old guy. But as it turned out he didn't seem to be remotely interested in me at all, he just smiled dozily and as soon as I stopped talking started telling me about himself, without any indication of hearing what I'd just said. I put down the coffees and sat myself at the table as he carried on excitedly. He would sometimes get ahead of himself and just end a sentence with a jumble of gibberish words in this thick Bushman accent. He didn't seem immediately threatening but I definitely did not feel he was of his right mind. He said he lived up north but, lived off the land, in the swamp most of the time. For a long time he just spoke of tilling the soil and catching his own food, living in huts and shit but then he awkwardly cracked out a peal of laughter and asked loudly, do ya got a girl here? I was pretty taken aback but before I could answer his smile completely flipped and he asked, suddenly stem, almost angry, is there a girl here mate? I shook my head but now the atmosphere had changed completely. He was gripping the table hard. And then just as quickly as it came on this moment passed and he continued as if nothing happened. It was the most schizo thing I'd ever seen. I can't remember what he said after that but eventually he showed himself out, coffee left untouched, and after walking a while down to the swamp looked back at me and said, as if touching on a shared joke, couldn't keep a girl safe here anywhere with all them bloody wurgles. And walked off. Wurgles was the word used to describe aboriginal people in like the 1800s. Fairly creeped out I locked up and took my gear and the car out to town. The heat wasn't letting up and the car ride is in my mind a bit of a haze. Outside the school I saw another teacher packing her things into her own car. She waved and I pulled up beside her. I must have looked shaken because she asked what was the matter with me. I told her about the weird man, to which she grinned knowingly and said did he scare you? She said he was mischievous but harmless. I remember her words, he'll fuck with you but he doesn't hurt a fly, if it is him. She said he wasn't often seen. It was as if she were talking about a folktale more than a real man. Apparently this man had lived near the area about 9 or 10 years ago. As recently as that he had been a regular visitor to the town and a well-liked guy. She had been much younger then but remembered that he would drive through town and sell veggies, and homemade jam, that he was fondly regarded by most. His wife was typically with him. She described them as, a sweet old couple, the two were regarded highly enough that when his wife passed away she was buried near the grounds, and some friends from the town helped do the funeral. The guy was obviously distraught and seemed completely shell-shocked for a long time after it happened. His trips into town got less and less regular. His demeanor seemed subtly changed, still jolly but in a different, stranger way. His behavior was increasingly odd. Everyone understood his pain following the death of his only real close company, so when he referred to her in passing, her daily doings, as if she wasn't dead there was mostly just sympathy, as well as the expectation that with some support he would get back to his old self. But things were only downhill from there. There were uncomfortable encounters where he asked people if they'd seen her around, to which there could be no easy response. The discomfort was not lessened when he started showing up disoriented, crying, telling people his wife had gone missing and that a search party needed to be formed immediately. Things came to a head when someone refused to dance around the issue and simply told him the fact of the matter. 
his wife was dead, buried not far out of town. By all accounts the man's response had been shocked though not as unhinged as perhaps expected. He sort of sadly accepted what he'd been told and wasn't seen around town for a while. But when next he came back his behavior was only more fucked. He announced that he didn't trust, a single fucking wurgle, and that he knew they'd done something with his wife. After some drunken spiels against wurgles and anger at their having stolen his wife, keeping her captive somewhere. He was strongly dissuaded by some local leaders from coming to the town as he had used to and seemed to understand because he wasn't seen in the town again. Word spread from some northern bars that he'd been seen drunk as a fish, telling anyone who would listen the swamp wurgles that tormented his wife in her final days, driving her mad with their mischief and how he hadn't believed her until it was too late. He was now fully convinced that a tribe had taken her away, and were holding her captive somewhere in the swamp. It also emerged that he had lost his house and his car, but he was still seen from time to time at the outskirts of the swamp, hunting, eventually he wasn't even a regular at any bars and as the years passed faded into a half-mythical figure, the mad old man of the swamp. Yet he was real. Sometimes hunting parties from the town would see him, even trade with him despite his now full-fledged hostility towards any and all wurgles he met. So this was the story she told me. She stressed, as I will hear, that she couldn't confirm any of this, having only memories of the man's happy years and having not seen him since. Some of the tale probably was just the garnishing of legend. But that he was out in the swamp for long periods at a time was certain. And the hunting parties which came across him always reported that he was convinced of his wife's continued existence, as a captive to some unknown tribe somewhere in the swamp. Now this tale left me feeling overwhelmed, exhausted but nonetheless a bit relieved. The frightfulness of this man was cut down a fair bit by the patheticness of his story and I felt a bit sorry for him. But I didn't want to go home for a while and spent some time alone in the town before heading back out. I got home just past dusk, when there was still a faint light about things. But as I tentatively looked around the house half expecting something to pop out and spook me I was aware of a greater darkness than usual. It took me a while but I investigated the windows and found that on those facing the swamp there was a growing layer of those fucking barnacle looking mollusks. It's hard to describe what it was like seeing a cluster of these cramped up on the glass but if you've seen the inside of a rock clinger, the fleshy part under the shell, you've got a good idea. I almost gaggy. I didn't much want to, but I worked up the nerve to go out and scrape them off. Well, the whole bottom part of the wall was practically packed with them. A lot had been there a long time or maybe had dried up and hardened in the sun because scraping them off was like pulling teeth and when they finally fell down they took a wee bit of splintered wood with them. Darkness settled and I was still going, working by the indoor lights and my torch. It was only once I'd finished, leaving a sickly smelling pile of the things at the base of the wall, piles of husks I couldn't be bothered to do anything with, that I realized how late it was and the deep silence that permeated everything. Little sounds were painfully heightened, enhanced by my frayed nerves, like the tiny drops of water somewhere nearby as a bird or a fish or something moved about, and the slight rustling of leaves on a mostly still night. I had the feeling of being watched. Now I was well aware that was just my mind playing tricks on me, but after the day's events couldn't be fucked putting up with this mischievous old cunt, so I quickly shone the torch across the tree line, fast enough to catch him if he tried to run away. But there was nothing. So I dragged the light along the bank slowly, scanning carefully for any signs of movement, every sound I heard was him fucking with me, and I shook a little. Then, as my grip steadied a little I saw it, a cluster of dead vines, or a tree maybe, half slumped half wrapped around the base of a big old conifer. For whatever reason I couldn't help but focus on it, something about it seeming distinctly out of place. Remember I'd had a long time to get to know the panorama of the swamp and something uncertain struck me about this white clump. Then, in one horrible movement, it pulled back back and went behind the tree. For a moment I could do nothing, paralyzed by fear when the silence was broken by a loud series of creaking and cracking sounds, and I knew something large was moving through the bush. Wasting no time I bolted indoors and you can imagine the sleepless night I spent there, damn near pissing myself every time I heard an owl or the house creak. The smell of those fucking barnacles had permeated the house, the smell alone, like sulfur, could have kept me up. The tapping from my room resonated into the living room where I huddle on the floor like a paranoiac. 
Somehow the crane flies were getting in, and now and again one would land near me and I'd have to crush it. I remember hearing a sort of clicking sound and looking up to see my ceiling coated in the fucking things. As I looked at their black mass of bodies the tapping seemed to register my pulse, getting louder and faster. I was sweating profusely, scared to look at the windows, trying to ignore the heat and the bugs and the tapping until it was too much and I switched on the television, an old set that still had rabbit ears and picked up barely the glitchiest signal but at least it drowned out the tapping. The screen just showed static and the vaguest forms of what looked like an infomercial or something but the sound quality was perfect when I heard, within seconds of switching it on, annual scholarship grant has been awarded to Anon Anonymous, who will be doing field work up in Arnhem. Congratulations Anon. The words just registered dimly and I couldn't be fucked anymore, so I just left the set on and the sound worked for a couple more names before giving out and giving way to a soft static which I turned up to full volume. The tapping noted this and got louder, beating like a metronome. At this stage I was almost laughing. I felt a bit delirious and couldn't get a grasp on if this was really happening or not. Then a different sound beat down the corridor. A hard loud knock, at the front door. I waited in terrified stillness. There came another knock, and then a voice. Hey Anon, you home? The voice was familiar, my friends from the town, I'd forgotten they were coming over on the weekend. Hey Anon, we're meant to be hanging out remember? But why was he over at 3 AM? Come on man, I can see you through the window. I looked up at the big windows but could see the dark night outside, maybe I could see some vague thing? My friend waving? Or just trees brushing against each other, or bugs at the window, it was impossible to tell. The thought of letting another person in made me realize the state I was in, the number of bugs on the walls and the ceiling and that god awful smell. I shouted out that I was going to let them, just be a minute. No response. As I scaled the corridor I noted I couldn't hear the tapping anymore. I flicked on the outdoor light but couldn't make out a thing through the dappled glass window on the door. I took the handle and cranked open the big front door then looked out onto an empty deck in the barren front section. I called out if he was out there or not. The, from behind me I hear the reply, the other door, anon. What the fuck, I think, I definitely heard him calling out from the front. But at this stage I can't be sure in my own senses, so I just call out that he shouldn't be a lazy cunt and should just come around the front. A long pause, as I stand at the open door, then, come on anon, don't be a lazy cunt come around and open the door. At this stage I feel barely awake, hardly registering my steps as I move back down the corridor, as I near the side of the house where I scraped off all the barnacles the rank smell increases steadily and I approach the back door, and look through the window to see if there's anyone there. For a moment I see nothing, just the bare swamp on all sides, then I turn to look onto the side of the door and see looking back at me a face so fucking horrible I don't like to even think of it today. The only thing I can compare it to is pick related. I fucking scream and fall back, and it fucking bolts it. The shock left me dizzy and I thought I would vomit. The smell reeling together whatever sanity I had left I knew I had to board up the windows, lock the door and wear out the night. As I regained my senses I had to hold onto the wall, grab onto things to pull myself up onto two legs. Once I did I was still wobbling on my ankles, like seasickness when I heard the unmistakable scatter of pots across the kitchen floor. I turned and realized I'd left the front door wide open. And the heaviness of the heat in the air seems to sink into my pores and I'm weighed into the corner against the back door. The chills that ran down my body were palpable. I couldn't have made a sound if I wanted to. I was entirely fixed on stilling myself and listening with an almost morphine clarity, the adrenaline I guess. Then again, the clash of disturbed cutlery, and a slow wheeze like a choked inhale, ha. Huh. When it was silent and still I could barely contain body shivers. My mind wasn't processing a thing but for any noise from the kitchen. I registered the cold impression of the door handle in my palm, but wouldn't dare turn it. If it creaked. Then, a soft crunch like of skin pressing on the floor. I saw something white breaching into the corridor, and again the low wheeze. Leisurely the small round eyes swiveled around and looked right at me. Ha. Huh. Fucking bolted it through the door, a flash of white through the windows, running for the open door. I burst forward blindly and ran, not know which direction or where. I couldn't afford to care that I was heading straight into the swamp. 
The idea of turning back for the car, of going around the house was, once I'd started running, a debunked option. It didn't even occur to me. The feeling of mud permeating and squelching in your shoes and the knowledge of it caking there, making every step painfully loud. More than once my foot caught a tough root and I fell ass over to it, but again I just couldn't afford to recognize it and just got back up every time. There was no visibility even by the time my eyes should have adjusted to the light, any moonlight was totally obscured by the overcrowded canopy. As I ran there were no sounds but by the time my body had run past its limit and I was drunkenly heaving through the trees, sweating I heard a lot of bug noise on the water and occasionally snippets of bird wings shaking off nearby, and weird croaks. Frantically I tried pick out that awful wheeze but couldn't focus on this for any extended period, because doing so seemed to make the experience into a practical reality, instead of a fever dream as I could only bring myself to process it as. There came a time when I wasn't even moving at speed, was a sweated out mess, borderline unconscious and soaked in mud. There was no sign by which to gauge where I was, only the huge figures of the trees around and the lumpen masses of the swamp. My knees started slipping under me and I heard a splash that silenced all the bugs as I slumped into the water, my entire body succumbing to that, pins and needles, numbness all at once. Face half buried under the waterline I only jerked my head up with difficulty, and the brackish water smelled richly off that sulfurous reek. For a long time I lay there, in a small pool to myself, my skin sensing nothing around it. Gradually the bug noise returned on the water surface, and it seemed like I could hear the distinct clicks and water plops of each one. Nothing of the light nor sound changed. If there was a moon it was lost under layers on layers of branches and clouds. It was impossible to tell how much time had passed. I couldn't even guess how long it had been till this weird noise emerged, slowly, from somewhere to the east of me. Immediately I knew it was no animal or forest sound because it was the sound of television static. The bug life went quiet and even the sound of the water and the canopy seemed to die out as this thick white noise spread out and neared. It took all my strength to muster just one arm. There was now the quiet splish splosh of feet in the water, growing louder. Outstretching the arm it felt like every sinew in my shoulder would snap. My fingers gripped the first thing they found and I sensed my body being pulled forward. Somehow, mud covered, shivering like all hell, and every joint burning I slumped into the upturned husk of a log and, out of the bare scraps of energy left in me pulled myself fully into the dark tube. This muffled the dim splish splash of footfall. There I sort of fell limp like a ragdoll, unable to exert any more. Somewhere nearby I heard a faint, ha. Huh. Now I couldn't control my breathing or stillness. I could see nothing but for a crescent slither of the log opening near my feet. The inside of the log was very cold and clingy, but my discomfort meant nothing as I strained out onto the little crescent slit of visibility. For a moment it was blotted out by something big and white. The sound of static was overwhelming, as if a television had been dumped in the bog. But then the thing was gone and in time the noise faded. And in time the bug noise picked back up. I don't know when I passed out. My clothes were wrapped on my bones and had dried there, this was the same for the mud in my shoes. For a moment I thought I was paralyzed, then an inch of crushed log under me gave way and I realized I was half fossilized into the shit. My eyes were so encrusted with dirt and gunk that at first they wouldn't open and there was a dull stinging as I peeled my eyelashes apart and the full light of the sun burned through, overwhelming my senses. It took me a little while to realize I was awake, and where I was. The compost odor of the log's interior and the brushing sense of things moving around under me and certain wet objects winding slowly through my hair alerted me to that. The feeling of worms feeling across my scalp, curling at the roots of hairs should have made me want to carve all my hair out but there was no way to think about this which made sense to me anymore. I wanted only to pull myself out of the husk and back to the house. I knew I had to pack my things and not return. There was no recovering from this. Yet at some level I knew how truly lost I was, already, and how hot the day was and how parched my throat and mouth. My retinas were burned ragged with heat and too little sleep. As I lifted myself up, bending my knees and dragging my body out bottom first, I noticed something different under my arm, a distinct lack of feeling in my armpit. As I peeled myself out into the shallow pool of last night, shedding spiders and worms falling out of my hair, I examined myself. There were a lot of cuts on the arm, when the mud was scratched off. 
But then I lifted the arm up and this time there could be no calm, and I screamed aloud, again, and again and again when I saw the whole of my armpit overfilled with a great hardened cluster of barnacles. I screamed so much I was dry heaving, and fell onto my knees in the water. In a moment of panic distraction, I forced myself to notice how the pool reflected the blue of the sky exactly. Without the blackened trees the scene would appear like two intersecting planes of sky and glass. But the feeling of all those thousands of little shells forming piles in my pit and the little islands of them that filed down my arm and in the dips of my ribs. Concentrating myself, improvising a gross curiosity I took my hand to the rock-like outer surface of the main lump and gritted my teeth as my nails scraped down, catching on some gaps and then prying as hard as I fucking could. There was a loud crunch and a lightning bolt of pain struck my side causing to reel over once more, a crack had appeared in the lump, under which was the pinky head of the inner goop. But I couldn't shake the awful source of that pain, the feeling of the their thin little roots pulling and popping in my skin. Finally I vomited. The numbness of it was now overcome by a hyper-awareness of all the little roots spread out in my meat. It took my all just to push past the sensation to find a rock. With the rock firmly in hand and sweating hard I brought it down once, twice, and again on the mass, each time it cracked and popped but the pain worsened and the throbbing horrible awareness of all those roots only increased, like they were clinging harder in there. Somewhere through the trees. The smell of smoke, and I'm moving towards it full speed, delirious. There's the whisper of a crackling fire and all I can do is follow, desperately. The emerald light of flames burned through the air and the rich smell was so reassuring that for a moment I forgot about the horrible things in my body. I stumbled out of the conifers into a small clearing, which looked like a drained patch of bog, where could be seen a crude sort of timber hut, looking hastily assembled from a few small trunks, offering little cover. The fire was burning only a few meters off, unshielded, from a pile of dry twigs and leaves, with no regard to the hut. Then my eyes were drawn to the outer rim of the clearing, marking its boundaries against the water, where had been erected several sharpened pikes, each adorned with the black faces of rotting animals. They mostly seemed to be dogs or possums but it was impossible to tell the degree to which most had rotted away. The sight of these things, intermittently swamped by the smoke, was something to behold. Who is it? Came a voice and it occurred to that a figure was moving somewhere inside the wall of smoke. Please, I blurted, hardly coherent, I'm sick I need help. The figure was still a while then moved forward, unshrouded by the blackness. I recognized immediately the bushman's old young face, at first unsmiling, squinting, then beaming, alert and wide-eyed on seeing me, as if to say, I'm so glad you could make it. Here my memory falters. I know I collapsed a few times, maybe fainted, because the guy told me so. To this day I can't remember how we got into his hut, where I was splayed on an unstable stretcher bed and told to be still while he got something. Next thing I know his dry old fingers are pressing something into my mouth, pills, and I swallow automatically. Then while his fingers are in there he sort of wriggle them about, they taste like shit, and starts hooting with laughter. Then a drink bottle nozzle, a drink of water to wash them down. I asked what it was and he busied himself with something in a bag for what seemed like minutes before announcing tramadol. As the painkillers took effect I drifted in and out of sleep. When once or twice I woke, it was to see the man crouched at my side, working hard on the armpit, and a dull scraping noise but no feeling whatsoever. At his side I caught sight of the ugliest looking dog I'd ever seen in my life. It looked like it had crawled, full formed out of the swamp matter, its body either wet or hairless, looking like black mats of folded leather. There was a loud noise of blunt objects grinding against each other, a sick pucking sound and then the slow, slow shloop of the length of roots being dragged out, some snapping off halfway out, where they dangled limp from bloody little holes under my arm. The sight made me nauseous and I looked to the dog, its grisly mouth unfolding in a friendly smile, as he dropped the bulk in his hand into a bucket, where it hit with the soft slash hard wet sound of a hammer on a bunch of eggs wrapped in a wet towel. Promptly, tail wagging, the dog dipped its snout into the bucket, emerging seconds later, panting here, with the, the limp threaded mass in its jaws, its thick saliva running in with the blood as it crunched it up and in painful looking gulps began to down it. As it did so I noticed how its gums were crowded with little, dried out whole scars. I passed out. I came to some time later that day. The shadows were slanted at a new angle, making deeper shades. It seemed to be late afternoon. 
The day was still boiling but a strip of grey clouds hung in the otherwise abandoned sky. A constant stream of wetness poured out of my bare chest and arms and I could feel it pooling underneath me. Groaning I moved onto the one arm and nervously looked at the end results. There was a lot of blood and dirt, and no bandages. There was also a series of small, black holes cramped in my flesh under the arm, the hair, it seemed, had been uprooted with the stuff, each leaking a little stream of blood, baked into a light crust in the heat. A couple still had small roots hanging out of them. Teeth gritted I pulled these last remaining ones out. All too sensitive to the feeling of their wet length peeling out, and the cold of the air on nerve endings and exposed meat in the newly excavated hole. As I leaned on the arm to sit up I felt the ungodly sensation of all the holes stretching open and taking in a collective gasp of cool air. But the fever seemed to be fading somewhat. I wanted to thank the man. He was nowhere to be seen and I was too weak to call for him, but I saw that the prehistoric looking dog was still at my side, panting happily. I put my hand down and rubbed the side of its face, then when it moved closer I patted it slowly. It panted and salivated. The shadows grew longer and I managed to put both feet of the bed, leaning at the waist to pat the dog, which was loving it. It was the closest I'd had to a normal experience in so long, that this simple activity felt like the greatest comfort in the world. Then the man stooped in, grinning madly, and asked how I was doing. I told him good and thanked him profusely. As with the previous time he seemed to zone out, just waiting to say his piece. Unceremoniously he thrust me a plate of ill-smelling meat chunks, as if to shut me up. I was an am to this day a vegetarian yet that rancid meat will probably always stand out in my mind as one of the best meals in my life. Glad I found you he said, more than once. He spoke in the same hurried pace as last time, if not more. He seemed to not want to discuss my health or how he removed the barnacles, opting instead to give me a long spiel on the fucking wurgles. However as he went on it was clear he considered the barnacles just an extension of the wurgle phenomena, some kind of tactic they used or form they took. But it wasn't even that clearly defined, he connected patterns with all the enthusiasm of a conspiracy theorist, all the time chucking his dog little chunks of his plate, eating none himself. Somewhere in the distance a series of hoop sounds hollered, my ragged nerves demanded I jarringly stick out my head in that direction, the old guy just went on talking. I observed that the sky was quickly becoming more overcast. They were getting trickier, he said, but the end was so near. I asked how far it was to town. He didn't hear or care and gave me a stem look as he said he knew he was close now. He'd found pictures of her, he said, and his eyes lit up, he pulled two mud caked volumes from his bag, and with practiced flipping opened them both to the pages he wanted to show me. I examined them. One was an old etching, or photograph it was hard to tell, the other a woman's weekly magazine from a few years ago. In each he had drawn a hard circle around a face in the background, in both a woman, though clearly not the same person. But I nodded regardless and said this is your wife. Now he stood up, his plate crashing onto the floor. How the fuck did you know that, I? He yelled. The dog released a low whine, recognizing the change in atmosphere. No the sky was pocked with light patches. Drizzle was beginning to fall. Improvising out of fear I said that he'd told me all about it at my house the other day, and repeated what I'd heard from my friend in town but as if I wholeheartedly believed it. As he listened he seemed confused, then weakened, almost apologetic and sat back down, picking up the plate and continuing to feed the dog half-heartedly. Yeah, I did, didn't I? He mumbled, convincing himself as he spoke. I realized he did not know how many days had passed since we'd met and struggled to bring the memory into clear focus, his face a picture of frustration. Then a light moved across his face and he was back to the big smiles and frantic speech. They had her in a glass vault, he said, in the middle of a carving out in a dry patch of woods. They used rituals, didn't play by our rules. They were, as he said, disgusting, so disgusting, as he said this he threw pieces of meat into the dog's mouth faster and faster. At first I thought she was just getting old, seeing things, he said, but then we found footprints heading to the house, none leading back. That's when I knew they were coming for her, and now they want me. They want to draw me out, luring me with these pictures. He produced more magazines, with almost every page showing a circled woman's face. 
He went on and on. About how they disgusted him. About how the only way to get her back was to play their game, however long it took. But he kept returning to disgust, how much they disgusted him. The rain beat harder and harder, dripping through the wide spaces in the roof of the hut, and it seemed to push him deeper into the spiral he was on, of talking about his disgust. Once he'd said it he couldn't shake it, and seemed to be unable to contain his disgust. Then he grabbed the dog's snout hard and yanked it head first towards me. See that? He shouted over the rain, thrusting the whining dog forward, see what they do? Forcibly, impervious to its attempts to wriggle away he pulled its lips up and pointed out the whole ridden gums. See? He screamed, more worked up than ever. The rain was splashing through quite strong now. His eyes were furious, he seemed not to notice as the dog cried and dug its claws into his hands, hard enough to draw blood. He had gripped its top and bottom lips hard and was screaming more and more, as if to drown out its cries, see what they do? As he pulled the top and bottom jaws wide, wide open. No, I said weakly as there was a little crack and the dog gave a long howl of pain and began wriggling harder and faster, batting its master's hands incessantly for him to stop. But he only pulled harder. How? Disgusting. It is. Even as I limply raise an arm to protest a line of blood was forming at the sides of the dog's mouth. Its big wet eyes filled with pain as the edges of its mouth ripped and split further and further. It was going nuts now, howling for its life and striking over and over. But he lifted it off the ground and with a face of furious effort slowly wrenched the jaws apart until, suddenly they snapped fully apart, spread out broken revealing its raw gagging throat, slick with blood, which released an unearthly, gurgling moan. With that he dropped it to the floor but the poor thing wouldn't stop making that noise, and thrashing, beating its skull against the hard floor over and over with bloody thumps, splintering the jaws even further, until finally it must have just given up because it lay there moaning softly. Its little chest raising and lowering with pained breaths. Wasting no time to collect himself he picked up an already sharpened pike and, in what seemed like one movement had picked up the dog and dragged its entire body through the pike so only the tip announced itself above the split jaws. I wanted so badly to believe that it was dead but as I looked I saw one wet eye flick down to meet mine and had to look away. As if reading my mind he said, with a gradual return to his vaguely said confusion, they have to be alive, for the rituals. He shuffled out of the hut, bearing the pike on his back. I knew I had to escape, but the rain was only getting worse. So I went out, foolishly to observe his efforts in clearing the ground and drilling the base of the pike into the ground, establishing one more totem. But I noticed a sense of something about him. He let go of the pike and, rain running through his scruffed beard, stared out into the forest. I followed his gaze, past the lines of conifers and the overlapping walls of mist just in time to see it, a huge old pine, bending at the middle, shaking slightly, move, almost bounce back into place, shedding a coat of water into the air. Then the tops of the trees, huge trees, rustled with the movement of something pushing them apart. As we stood under the fresh pike there was roll of thunder from the woods. Not thunder, a higher noise, like metal plates ground against one another followed by a set of huge impending thuds that sent vibrations up my legs. Under the noise of the rain I was aware of the sound of thick static and started backing into the hut. The old man stayed out in the mud and the rain, and began shouting things I couldn't hear. There was another deafening groan, and a dark shape brushed through the highest tops of the trees momentarily. The old guy was at the wall now, picking something up, a rifle. There was a click and then immediately he fired. Come on. He was screaming, come on you fucking cunts. There was another shot, and another. The tectonic groans came more and more, and the trees were being bent and pushed by something massive behind them. And the old man screaming at them in the rain to show themselves. Where is she? He screamed, face red and wet and saliva streaming from his scarred mouth as he hollered, releasing a volley of shots in all directions. I moved to the edge of the door, slipping behind him in the frothing mud, all the while keeping my eyes on the forest line, transfixed in a sort of horrible wonder by the huge things in the pines. Where is she? What have you done with her you fucking cunts? Through his screams I could hear the wavering vibrato of tears. Then I saw it, if only for a second, this enormous black shape, moving back behind the trees, then a long, tree-like limb stretching out and wobbling forward, testing the air like a feeler. 
The static sound and the sulfur smell were richer than ever now, the air felt electric. And now two more stood in full height and were taking ground shaking strides towards the hut. One snapped its lump of what I suppose was a head right around, and I caught sight of two white eyes. Too much for me, I turned and fled. I stumbled in the rain and cracked my bad ribs. Pulling myself up I hobbled off as fast as possible, hardly able to see through the rain, as volleys of faraway bullets exploded against the deep tectonic scraping of the huge fucking things. And over top of it all, the man's wild voice, screaming its lungs out. Where is she, where is she? I ran for I don't know how long, splashing face down in every other rivulet, getting mangled by every other thorny bush. The landscape was totally changed in the rain, overflowing with little waterfalls and the nervous swaying off old trees in the wind. The commotion was overwhelming and as I crashed my way through the dense brush I became alerted to some calls coming for not far off, it was my name. In my friend's voice. Fuck this, I thought and turned to run in the opposite direction, foot snagging on a collapsed branch. I yanked desperately at it, the voice getting closer and closer until finally it broke apart and I sprint forward, directly into the fucking thing. I screamed as its arms thrusted out of the trees and grabbed me by the shoulders and tried wildly to escape, until I was looking at the terrified, confused face of my friend from the town, and his two buddies trailing not far behind. I will keep the rest of this brief. Needless to say I refused to return to the house, so was driven by my friends back to one of theirs. They reckoned I was suffering from exposure and got me a change of clothes and things that I was either unable or unwilling to tell my story in full. To this day I remain quite unwilling, for obvious reasons. I only showed them the holes in my armpit, and the parts about the med bushman. I deliberately excised everything else. Back in the comfort of a lit, warm room, with the storm rattling the windows outside as if taking place somewhere far far away, I no longer trusted my own experience and fell into a sort of waking lucid dream state. Not quite conscious and rational but nonetheless aware of the impossibility of my own experience. But how had they found me, I asked. They exchanged odd, worried glances. Then I was told this story. We went to yours at the arranged time. When we got there we saw all the windows and doors were locked, even though it was sweltering. So we knocked at the door, no reply. We figured you had just gone for a walk or something, so sat on the front porch smoking duddies, and cracked a few beers. A full hour passed and we decided to get up and go. Right as we did so, though. Here he paused, obviously uncertain about how to retell this next part, well, someone shouted out from inside the house, saying you weren't home. I was awash with full-fledged body shivers as he said those words. Well, we thought what the fuck, seeing as we'd been there for an hour and only now this guy decides to speak up. So we ask who it is, no reply. So we knock again and this voice, coming from directly behind the door, says that you've gone into the swamp. We keep asking questions, asking to be let in knocking at the door but, got no more responses. At first we thought, well you know, that it was just you pulling a prank. But as the rain came in, figured we ought to at least check, just in case. I let this information sink in. Then I asked, why did they think it was me pulling a prank? Why would I do that? Now the mood got really awkward and many more glances were exchanged. Well, said my friend slowly, looking right into my eyes, well the thing is, it was your voice. The next few days were spent recuperating. My friends said they would put me up until I found a different place. But it was clear now I couldn't continue there. I was no longer myself, didn't act the same, seemed rattled out of my own persona. And I knew the popular consensus was that I had gone mad. I got looks in the street. And I didn't blame them. When I resigned from the teaching position it seemed a relief to the other staff. I guess word of my descent into madness spread fast. Only my friends, who heard for themselves that unexplainable voice believed me, they were good to me in the following days, returning to the house I was never to go back to and collecting my stuff. Three weeks later I was driving back home, to a family who cried a lot and kept saying I would get better, more for their own sake than mine. But I did get better, in time. I kept in touch with the friends I made there and completed my thesis on the back of the short experience I'd had. I won't bore anyone with the details of my reintegration period, 
except to say that it was hard and ongoing. There is only one more thing to add. It happened as the place was being emptied of my stuff. One of those people who helped was the school teacher who'd been so kind to me, and like the blokes who found me out in the woods didn't treat me like a nutter. She said it almost in passing for some reason, though I am certain she was aware of its full meaning, she said. You know, it's no wonder you came across the old swamp bloke. That place you were staying was the old house he and his wife used to live. Thoughts travel in both directions.